Legendary Tactics is proud to present Jason Matthews, acclaimed designer of Twilight Struggle and Imperial Struggle, here to chat with me, NATO, on Legendary Tactics. So we are here with uh, Jason Matthews, the acclaimed designer of such uh, titles as Twilight Struggle, Imperial Struggle, 1989, Dawn of Freedom, and 1960, The Making of a President. And uh, we really appreciate you taking some time out to uh, do an interview here for us uh, at Legendary Tactics and for our viewers. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. It's yeah. uh, great to meet you and, and talk to your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, how are things going for you these days? How's life? <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's complicated. Uh, things are not so wonderful in Washington, D.C., and that's where I work and make my living. Um, and uh, I, I have some hope that we're about to turn a corner, just like I have some hope that um, COVID is also about to turn a corner. Mm -hmm. um, so that could make for a much more pleasant 2021, but it definitely has not started out that way. Yes, oh, it's been it's been a strange time for all of us, absolutely. And and so, what's it like? I, I assume you're you maybe during COVID, you've had more time to design and work on some some games. So, what's it like designing games in a in a pandemic environment? Well, um, it it has been. I would say we're fortunate as a society in general to have been working on all of these tools for um, distance learning, distance interaction in general before COVID hit. And so uh, I've been able, fortunately, to apply some of those tools to play testing for games that I'm working on. Uh, Twilight Struggle Red Sea is actually in play testing and I'm using Tabletopia uh, with the play test set and able to get you know 50 people who are trying it regularly yeah and that's infinitely better actually than me putting together 50 playtest sets and mailing them out and waiting yes. for people to respond somehow yeah yeah no that's because uh, yeah i guess it is because it's um well just that's the other way you'd have to do it i mean because you probably have to draw playtesters from wherever you get them right um, yeah so that's so you're finding it actually easier in some ways to get some playtesting done it is i i really the thing that keeps me from being a more prolific designer is how much I hate physically manufacturing games. It's yeah. just not like my deal. Uh, if I were a more accomplished graphics designer, I guess I would be better at it. I did get some lessons from somebody who is an accomplished graphics designer um, during the COVID process. So he, he helped improve my um, capacity for making cards and whatnot. Oh, good. <laughs> and uh, so what, what are your main considerations when you're choosing a game to fully, you know, develop? Because you probably get ideas, like all of us, you get a, a bunch of different ideas. You know, do you, have a, do you have a process where you have lots of stuff on the go at the same time? Or is it just kind of one and at a time you focus in on, on that? Um, I prefer the one at a time process, but as of late, I've had two or three projects that I'm juggling. Mm -hmm. um, and... I found that to be okay. Um, ordinarily, as you know, I, I've been working with a co-designer and that has helped make me accountable to somebody else. So mm -hmm. we set a deadline together and then things have to be done, right? Or, yeah. or you embarrass yourself or you get to be yelled at, whatever. So I actually find that working with a co-designer in that way helps keep me accountable. Although on um, TS Red Sea, I'm doing it by myself, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, Twilight Struggle is sort of familiar ground. Yes. So is that you mean Ananda Gupta uh, specifically? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and Ananda and I, um, Ananda, I, we talked about it. I think he may end up doing his own um, um, small TS offshoot like oh, this, wow. um, and we. Um, he, he was kind enough to review the cards. I, we're friends, so, you know, we yeah, can yeah. collaborate yeah. casually as well. Yes, yeah, that's good. Yeah, you, you're forced to play test each other's stuff. With your right, right, enough. exactly. That sort of thing <laughs> okay. is not a problem. Yeah. And what, what do you feel has contributed the most to your success overall as a, as a designer and, and that sort of thing? Well, 
I think the thing that appeals to me, I mean, mostly I am designing games that I want to play. So that it's uh, a little iconoclastic in that way because, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's based on me rather than the, what the gaming public might want. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing that draws me to a game, what I enjoy in a game is a sense of narrative and I focus on that element of design. And I think we have hit a point in the gaming hobby where that has become important to a lot of gamers as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can't help but admire the brilliance of someone like Reiner Knizia, mm -hmm. but that sort of mathematical style of Euro, um, ultimately when you see it the first time, it's like magical. Yes. And then when you've played it 10,000 times, it seems a little dry. Yeah. And so I think that's why there's been this evolutionary shift in the broader gaming public, both towards things that are a little more like role-playing, you know, in the Gloomhaven mm -hmm. universe, but, yep. uh, and then also in the, in the context of making these sort of historical simulations a little more popular because they have that narrative arc. Yeah, is that why you you seem to be drawn to the card driven game specifically? It's a lot of uh, uh, your designs seem to be, you know, use that core mechanic of of uh, you know the cards with the, you know, and you've got the choice of the event or the operations points or whatever it uh, is called that particular game. I is think that what, part of it? that's definitely part of it. But what cards have done so effectively that no other mechanism had done previously as well is um incorporate politics um all of my games so far have are on this kind of um nexus between conflict and politics or political conflict or wars that are very political you know that that sort of thing and um prior to mark herman identifying the use of cards to simulate politics the way politics was done in war games in particular was either a, a chart which made it random yep. or it was hardwired into the rules which made a rule book that was you know 5,000 pages and it uh, yes, had all yes. of these annoying contingencies that you had to memorize. Neither of those things work very well. Mm -hmm. So what card driven games do so well is that each card is essentially a rule right mm -hmm. and each rule can be contextualized both to a time in the game to a board condition in the game and that helps simulate politics much more effectively than either a randomized dice roll yeah. or hardwired rules both of which seem like sort of engineering approaches to politics and you know it just doesn't fit that well yeah no that's right and and especially you know the way you you know a lot of your games have worked where you've got an you know an early deck a mid deck and an end or you know uh, end turn uh, or end part of the game deck you can you know kill you know basically re represent the history in a way that it was you know it makes some logical like sense yeah, yeah right yeah. exactly at the right time the right thing is happening at the right time Yes, yeah, you don't That's want the, the idea. American Revolution to happen like Imperial Show. You don't want it to happen in the in the uh, beginning start, you know, start of the game because it just wasn't historical. But right. the timing of it within that era might might have been variable depending on the the situation. So exactly. And so, what is your favorite game of all time? Um, you asked that in the. the I, I am very much in the. Um, uh, it, it's like the same question for movies or favorite book, like, well, yeah. which with whom and, you know, la, la, la. Like I could give you a thousand excuses, but I'll give you a couple that I love. Yeah. Sure. Um, I love El Grande. That is like one of my favorite euros. I don't know. Yeah. Has it weathered all that well? I don't know, but it's still amazing. And it has a card driven mechanic actually for a euro. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing about it. Um, I, even though it's not, politically correct and I'm not sure it could be published right now I think Pax Britannica was a fantastic narrative experience um, um, dealing with the age of imperialism yeah. and um, I you know I, I love a thousand different games to be honest I I really I think rebellion is one of the best implementations of 
of um, you know an intellectual property on in a board game setting. But I, I like classics like Diplomacy. I like um, I, I really enjoy Dune. I, I I don't know. I could yeah, go yeah. on. Oh, okay, yeah, so it's, it's how I find it. You've always got your favorite game per genre, you know. Yeah, yeah, game. that would be that would be fairer. I would still yeah. have to think about it, but I could do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, is there any particular uh, design that the like games design that you really admire, or something where you remember when you were um, learning about more about game design, maybe earlier in your career, and you said, "Wow, that is innovative." That just jumped out at you. And it may be Mark Herman with the car driven game uh, idea. But... Yeah, obviously um, I've stolen liberally from Mark Herman and I, I always try and credit him for having this amazing insight uh, that has kind of spawned a little sub hobby. Yeah. But um, a designer who I admire incredibly, and I have almost, you know, the, you would find no real element of his design style in anything I do, um, is Michael Schacht. He's uh, a Euro guy, German Euro guy, but what I find he does so amazingly well is take a binary decision, like do this or this, and then from that binary, binary decision, you can plot out strategy like three or four turns ahead. And so he did like Zularetto and uh, Paris Paris, a bunch of games along those lines. And what makes his games I think so fantastic is that you can play with kids because it's just a binary decision mm -hmm. and they can play, you know, as well, as seamlessly as any adult, but the adult will be looking at the strategy six stages down and the kid will basically be yeah. worried. Do I put a tiger or do I take the truck? Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting binary choice. <laughs> I haven't tried those games. So that's, uh, yeah, it's, that's funny. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, uh, but you have, you say he hasn't really directly influenced you perhaps. Yeah, I, I, you yeah. know, I'm always designing these complicated things. So I, I don't yeah. really, um, I, I wish I I had the mind that worked in that way where I was um, I developed a mechanism, you know, just floating around in my head, and then I found some game that that fit it. But it's it's yeah. always the other way around <laughs> <Yeah>. for me. <laughs> and actually, it kind of leads to my next uh, question. So, you know, a game like Imperial Strike, I thought Twilight Struggle was was ambitious when I when I first encountered it. I remember, um, you know, when I first started playing it and probably about 10 or 15 games in and uh my my gaming buddy and i um uh, cax who works with me on the on the channel we felt like we had just scratched the surface like it was just that feeling of just this undiscovered country and then imperial struggle came out and it has that same feeling only bigger like it's just feels so expansive and like how do you how do you um do you ever envision doing another game of a similar scope to imperial struggle or or even bigger, or is it kind of like, is that kind of the size that you would like to stay at and, and the, at that complexity? Well, I think Ananda and I both like our history in that scale. Like we like big history. Um, and so it's, it's always appealing. I don't know how many more human conflicts fall into that scope, right? So the Cold War and England versus France are probably the two foremost rivalries in human history, mm -hmm. you can find a few others, right? So the, uh, what has happened between uh, China and Japan over the course of several centuries and yeah. maybe yeah. the Russians and the Turks or the Austrians and the Prussians. Yeah, they, there are other examples, but, but we've kind of covered the, the low hanging fruit now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So if I find something, if I find something that I, I think uh, fits that mold, I definitely will go after it. Oh, nice. uh, we, we had a lot of very specific design goals for the Imperial struggle. And um, I'm, I'm glad to see that people are appreciating it. Yeah, no, that's great. It's a, it's a fabulous game. Um, and when you're designing a game with like, you know, as at that, at that level of complexity with so many interactions and card, you know, uh, synergies and so forth. 
I mean, how do you know when playtesting is is done? Like, when do it's, you, it's, it's just when do never you done. The, the, the long and short answer to your question is never done. I just, so Twilight Struggle is 15 years old last yeah. year. Um, yeah. And I, about three months ago, someone brought a rules question that was still a interaction between two cards of first impression. I'd never seen it before. No one had ever asked it. It wasn't in the fact. Oh, it was yeah. nowhere to be found. And we, uh, I called it on. I'm like, well, what do you think <laughs> about this? <laughs> so, um, so you have at least 15 years of questions for more. Right, for exactly. <laughs> um, I feel like, you know, um, you after you release it into the wild and you see and, and you, the questions that come up are the same ones that you've answered all the time, then you kind of get a sense that, yeah, okay, we've covered the waterfront. But I know for sure that you will not, no matter what you do, if you're, if you're pursuing these card driven games and you have, you know, a deck of 200 cards, the way that they're going to interact, um, you can't, no human being can anticipate all of the potentialities. Yes. You will yeah. definitely still be answering questions online. And thank God that that's a thing because, you know, when I started in the hobby, you would write a question to the general and wait six months and hope they printed it. And maybe until then you had to just make up your own rule. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot more house rules <laughs> coming along. And that's actually was my next question was, has there ever been like a house rule or a rule change that's popped up in the in on the geek or in some sort of correspondence where you know suggested by a fan or someone and you, and you think wow that's a great idea <laughs> wish i'd thought of that or wish i'd uh i've definitely seen some fan cards that i thought were really clever and mm -hmm. i was like oh that you know we should have done that maybe um i don't I, and I have taken some fan variants extraordinarily seriously. Um, really? One in particular in uh, one in particular for 1960 making of the president with how um, how the issues are manipulated. Um, at the end of the day, I haven't I haven't changed any game based on um, like fan input, but I absolutely encourage it like anybody who wants I, i'm always supportive if you you have interesting decks of cards you want to put out there whatever yeah. I, i'm all about it i'm good wow great right. um yeah. yes no that's great and then um as the hobby evolves like what trends do you see currently in gaming and game design that you like and is there anything you dislike um well on the dislike front um, I guess I've been in the hobby long enough to see like things cycle back. Uh, and when I started in the hobby, um, I didn't, I, I played a lot of things that were in addition to playing war games, obviously I played a lot of things that were sort of proto euros. So civilization or the 18 XX games, they weren't, Mm -hmm. war games per se but you know they um they had but they still had kind of a war gamey feel to them and they had war game length for sure so mm -hmm. uh, i was in a games group in law school and we would get together every saturday and we would play two you know between four and eight hour games and think nothing of it and that was our weekend we played two games yeah yeah um and Euros change all that, right? So Settlers of Catan showed up right uh, from Germany over to Mayfair right when I was finishing law school. And um, and we're like, oh my God, you know, there's you can play a game in less than two hours with all the strategic decision-making and it feels so great. And now we've played 10 games instead of two and la, 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 la. And, uh, I have noticed that the hobby is creeping back the other way. Like we're going slowly but surely into longer and longer games and not in the war games field. The war games field is still absorbing the lessons from Euros. But in yep. the Euro field, they're going, you know, a five or six hour Euro is no longer something that uh, seems very strange. Um, and mm -hmm. that, that 
uh, desire to add complexity in Chrome, which almost killed the wargaming hobby, now seems to be something that the Euro gaming hobby is uh, adopting. Mm, yeah. Wow. So, and that's, so that's a trend that you're seeing that you, you dislike. Is there anything that you're seeing that's new and, you know, that you're or trending that you like? Um, I mean, I do, I really love what's happening in uh, some corners of wargaming that, um, where very non-traditional styles of war games are um, being developed. They're not hex encounter. They're not um, in a way, you know, Twilight Struggle and Coin and the Coin games are examples of this, but but um, a game like Undaunted, which is getting really rave reviews and is a really interesting way to s simulate small small unit combat, and it's totally stealing from European design, but it's applying it in, in ways in wargaming that, that make it very exciting and uh, innovative and yeah. uh, might ultimately save the hobby rather than letting a bunch of old guys die off with their stacks of counters. <laughs> with, with a copy of Panther Leader. Or yes, exactly. Panther Blitz. <laughs> Marry me like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's good. Um, so a few rapid fire questions for you. So these are just, you know, designed to be sort of quick question, quick answer. If you want to elaborate, though, please feel free. So your favorite uh, Cold War game that is not Twilight Struggle or published by GMT? Uh, I'd have to say that's 13 Days. Uh, I mean, I tried a lot of the old war games on the Cold War that had a fictionalized conflict between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. Um, but I, I guess, you know, 13 Days is derived from Twilight Struggle, so maybe that's a little arrogant of me to say, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I really like that game. It's a great, a great, short, punchy game. Yeah, nice. Um, best game created before 2000? God, I have a lot of that. I, I, I have a ton of games that I think are amazing that were created before 2000, but um, I guess I'll have to just go with El Grande because I already so that that was one of yeah. my favorites. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, best game to play with a significant other? Mm. Those, um, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to cause an argument or you do not want to cause an <laughs> argument? I think in general that those, uh, that a, a game like uh, Patchwork is really good for playing with a, uh, a spouse or, or a partner or whatever. Yeah, okay. Uh, most enjoyable game you've played during the COVID period so far? Um, I really, I, I, th I didn't play Undaunted until COVID, and I think that that is fantastic. I really, um, I finally have gotten a hold of my physical copy of Shores of Tripoli, and I think that's also amazing. Yeah, my, mine just arrived yesterday, <laughs> so... That's great. I think you did some play testing for that. I did. I did. Yeah. So, so I, it, it wasn't exactly new to me, but it's nice to have real bits. Yes, absolutely. Um, one word to describe the most important characteristic a game designer needs. Um, I would say patience, mm -hmm. uh, both uh, patience, both for the process for how long game companies take, and um, in receiving input from players, because it's it's easy to be thin-skinned about things you create, and it's the wrong reflex. Mm. Oh, that's good. Your favorite comic book character? I heard you're a big comic book fan. I'm such a comic book nerd. This is worse than the damn favorite game <laughs> Sorry. question. I'm, I'm going to go with Captain America, though. OK, good. Very patriotic of you. Yeah. Uh, best kids game that is still fun as an adult? Uh, I also love kids games uh, and I, I have two children, so I played a lot of them for a while. Yeah. Um, I think the uh, Gulo Gulo is amazing. Like, I, almost all the dexterity games are great to play with kids and great as adults. I love Gulo Gulo and Hamster Roll, I think are my two favorites. Along all those. right, that's good. Best expansion for a base game? Um, I am... I have some annoying 
anti-expansion thing. So okay. well, I I, uh, it's still waiting on the twilight struggle. Yeah, you're, if you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to grow old waiting on it. Um, I, I mean, I we've done a few cards, but the cards are mostly been there to kind of um, fix certain things. Um, but uh, the one I think that I enjoy playing with the most is the terraforming Mars expansions. Okay, great. What game did you play most recently? Most recently, I. I purchased that Disney, um, the the kids and I played the uh, Disney. Um, Maleficent? Uh, no, no, the Jungle Boat, the Jungle Cruise game. Oh, you know, really? It wasn't really very good. We we really are humongous Disney fans and I, I like what Prospero Hall has been putting out for the most part, but the Jungle Cruise was not a win in our house. Oh, okay, <laughs> nice. Um, a novel or book that inspired uh, your any game design of yours? Um, when I decide that I'm going to do something, I almost always go seek out the one of the foremost, um, you know, historical uh, books on the subject. Um, but in terms of a book coming first and then me designing a game on that subject, I would, it would have to be um, for Founding Fathers and a Miracle in Philadelphia. Hmm. All right. Um, game, a game whose success most surprised you? Well, they all sort of surprised me, but I guess uh, Twilight Struggle is, Twilight Struggle is the most um, was the biggest surprise. We just didn't think that it would take off quite the way it did. Yeah. And I was nervous, to be honest, about Imperial Struggle. I'm, I'm glad it's being received so well. But as you know, it's not Twilight Struggle. So it was entirely possible that people would open the box and be like, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> um, you know, we, we were looking for Twilight Struggle with tricorns, and here, we, here we've got this mess instead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is, but it's nice. I, I'm glad you didn't just give us another Twilight Struggle clone. Like you could see that there was so much thought put into it to, you know, make it, you know, kind of has still no re respect its roots, but take it in a new direction. And I, I, I think ultimately, I think people will appreciate that. Yeah, me too. I, I think, you know, they have enough mm -hmm. options for Twilight Struggle clones at this stage, if that, if that's really yeah. what they're looking for. Um, and we were trying to, we we're trying to do some different things, like illustrate the interaction between war and peace, um, yeah. and why those things are important, and why the little victory point hexes on your war game matter. Yeah. Um, and I think I think we do some of them. Okay. What's the longest game you've ever played to completion? I played War in Europe, um, all of it, and uh, we set it up in a guy's basement, and we would play two Saturdays a month, all day. And <laughs> I think it took us four to six months to finish. Wow. <laughs> was it worth it in the end? Was it, in terms of a gaming experience, did you walk away saying, well, it, that was worth it? I, it was worth it, but it wasn't my favorite monster after I played it all. It was yeah. the longest for sure, but, but we played a lot of Empires in Arms, which is a little more manageable. You can get it done in a couple of days. Um, and I love those games. Yeah. Your biggest pet peeve as a designer? Um, my biggest pet peeve as a designer is um, cutting cards and sleeving them. Yeah. <laughs> Prototype building. Prototype <laughs> building in general, just all of it. Um, biggest surprise game of last year? Oh, God, this is dangerous because I, I should have looked this up um, <laughs> because now I have to remember which what came out. Oh, okay. Well. 2020 and 2019 have melded in my okay, mind. Okay, let's say, let's say in the past couple of years then. Let's get, open it up a bit. Um, so um, I guess Un Undaunted came out this year and that was one of my favorites from this year. Um, I, I was trying to find a Euro that I really thought was fantastic for the last couple of years. Um, I think, or I, I like the crew also. Um, I thought that was a clever trick-taking game. Okay, great. Um, the first thing I do when designing a game is blank. Uh, the first thing I do 
when designing a game is to decide on the parameters. Um, so we decide if, it, if I'm working with somebody or I do it myself, I decide uh, how many cards, how long is it going to play, um, how big a board, and I let those parameters help me define some of the mechanics and what else I'm going to do. Yeah, so you kind of work backwards. I work backwards. Nice. Okay. Um, this is last of the rapid fire ones, and we got a couple more questions uh, after that, and then uh, then we'll be good. Um, so I know the NATO card is your least favorite card in uh, Twilight Struggle. What's your favorite? Um, uh, I really like, I really like how Southeast Asia scoring works. Um, and it was something we came up with sort of at the last minute, Be, but it's, it was our solution to figuring out how does Southeast Asia not be important suddenly is important and then goes away <laughs> yes. how, how do we get that to work in a game like twilight struggle and that's southeast asia scoring was our answer yeah, i gotta get all that influence into malaysia and burma and <laughs> right yeah. and then and as then soon whatever. as that scoring card goes away you stop caring about any of those places yeah. <laughs> oh that's great okay well just a, a you know a couple uh questions to finish up here what's your most anticipated game of 2021 um, there's always a bunch of things that I'm monitoring, um, I, I, and there are a bunch of things that I still haven't acquired that I need to get. Like I, I don't have Versailles yet, and I really um, want to get my hands on that and try it. Obviously, that's sort of in my yes, us too. <laughs> it's yeah, right. it's in my wheelhouse, for, obviously for a variety of reasons. Um, I saw um, something extremely interesting. Um, a prototype uh, dealing with um, the American Revolution that I really want to uh, give a go, and I don't know if it'll be out for next year or not. But you know, who, everything is delayed. Yeah, I know. It's been terrible. <laughs> exactly. Um, and what is your next project? And can you share anything about it? So um, obviously, I have uh, I have Twilight Struggle Red Sea. That's uh, in play testing, yeah. and that was actually my next question was just if there's anything you can share about that one in, in particular. But if you have any other projects, for sure. Um, so, um, but another project that is about ready for play testing is um, the United States versus Aaron Burr. Um, I don't know if you have had a chance to play Louis Real or Treason, the trial of Louis Real, being no, a. No, I haven't. A good Canadian you it, yes I, I should have but I haven't <laughs> right so first of all it's a fantastic game so you yeah. should get your hands on it it's a short two-player card driven game okay. um, I'll be shocked to learn you don't like it and uh, it applies the card driven mechanism to a trial setting um, and I was like oh this is super clever Al Berry the designer um, I think he's originally a Canadian, if I've got this right, but he practices law in the United States. Um, and I, you know, I talked to him about collaborating and, and hopefully we will get a chance to do that sometime. And I wanted to apply his system to uh, the context of a court case in the United States, but um, unfortunately, the the differences between Canadian law and the United and law in the United States were actually so vast that you can't just steal his system and apply it because the juries don't have to be unanimous. The juries are smaller. They're like all of these uh, differences that have a big impact, actually. So anyway, uh, I'm I. I'm doing a game on Aaron Burr, who most famously uh, shot uh, Hamilton. Uh, now every 13-year-old girl knows that in America. But, <laughs> um, but after he shot Hamilton is when things really got weird because uh, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson threw him off the ticket for vice president. He was vice president um, when he shot Hamilton. <laughs> and um, Thomas Jefferson threw him off the ticket for the next election. He never, and uh, 
so Burr is sort of like disgraced and he decides on this scheme to uh, put together a group of adventurers, um, capture the city of New Orleans and then invade Mexico and create a kingdom where he's the king. <laughs> and wow. um, though he was never tried for killing Tom or Alexander Hamilton, he was tried for that. <laughs> so uh, Thomas Jefferson has him tracked down and hauled into court uh, and tried for treason. And um, he gets off. Uh, but, you know, treason trials are all the rage here in the United States at the moment. So um, yeah. <laughs> I figure it's a good topic for a game. Yeah. Uh, wow. And uh, can you tell any th us anything about uh, Red Sea conflict in the Horn of Africa? So... Um, Twilight Struggle Red Sea, uh, it fixes something that, I, the, there are all these little nagging things I have about Twilight Struggle that aren't fixed. The NATO card is one of them. Um, but another one, I, I knew even when I did the, when we did the original cards, I was like, ah, I should have done something about the Horn of Africa. Because at the end of the Cold War, when I was fully conscious, I, there was a major conflict that occurred uh, in Ethiopia and Somalia and, um, and then, of course, the droughts and we are the world and all the stuff that yes. uh, most of us who are old will remember. Um, so, but I didn't. We don't, there's no Red Sea card. There's no uh, Horn of Africa card. And um, there had been a lot of interest in like adding more cards to Twilight Struggle. People were interested in, you know, increasing the adding variants by adding new cards. And my general experience with that is that um, they're not all that well received by, the, by the, the strong fans of the game because they don't like their play styles to be disrupted. You know, they, yeah. they have their strategies, they know how all the cards work. If you throw 50 more cards into the mix, it just messes <laughs> with our minds. Yeah. So. I was like, okay, Gene, let me just work on doing a, a separate game. We'll use the Twilight Struggle system, but I'll make a short little game and it will accomplish two goals. First, I'll fix the fact that I never did a Horn of Africa card. And secondly, it can serve as an introductory game, part of your lunchtime series so that when you play this, then you can teach someone the full, they will know all of the rules so that they can play the full game, but they didn't have to make the three hour investment and yeah, absorb yeah. everything all at once. And so it's gonna be like a, a, a two turn Twilight Struggle that will help you teach your kid or your wife to play the full game if you're so inclined. Or you can just play five matches of Twilight Struggle. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. just two turns. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's 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 a very but you know what I I it's there's still two very dramatic turns. So um, I feel like after you finish a game, you'll be like, okay, that's cool. Let's play again. Yeah. Oh, good. As long as you don't get two hands of uh, in a row of three scoring cards, uh, <laughs> you know. Right. Right. That was the worst right. hand in Twilight Struggles. That is the worst hand in Twilight Struggle. That fortunately isn't really possible in TS Red Sea because of the way the, the scoring cards are structured. Yeah, no, that's great. No, um, that's uh, basically the questions that I had for you. And thank you so much for taking some time to, uh, uh, to um, you, know, and, you know, just go over these, these things and share some of your process and, uh, and everything. It's been great to meet you. It's my pleasure, Nathan, and thank yeah. you so much for having me on. Uh, you guys uh, stay safe and warm up there in Canada. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs>